Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. If we compare Nancy's childhood with the way most of her peers grow up, we can say that the girl was lucky. She studied in England, graduating from a boarding school for girls. It was a first-class institution. Compulsory and elective subjects, sports and excursions, beautiful surroundings and beautiful uniforms. How did Nancy get there? Her father worked in a division of a Russian bank, a prominent position. Nancy's mom had a vocation as a housewife. She couldn't imagine anything else worth doing as a woman in this life. Perhaps she should have been born in the Orient, and some sheikh there would have carried her in his arms, for she was beautiful, delicately charming, and her home was a world she did not want to leave. All those homemade napkins, plates and pads were infinitely important to her. She could spend hours searching online stores for something that would make the apartment even cozier. Her father didn't come far for dinner, but every dinner turned into a feast. Some meals took Molly hours to prepare. And all that china, tablecloths, wine, expensive glasses created the ambience, so to speak. But when Nancy was at home, she felt older than that. The girl's mother so helpless outside these walls. May beautiful hair, silk dress and jewelry may not take her eyes off her, but if this well-groomed housecat had found herself on the streets, would she have survived there? Nancy, thanks to her friends, teachers and herself first of all, understood today's day much better. She had passed her driver's license early, she was going to graduate high school and live apart from her parents. But then disaster struck and her plans changed abruptly. Actually, disaster is a bit of a mouthful. There were changes at the bank, downsizing, and her father was fired. But for him, who didn't expect it, the sky fell to the ground. For mom, of course. She also explained later in a whisper to Nancy, as if dad could hear from the back room. But Molly's mom was terribly afraid of traumatizing his psyche. She explained that there was a great grief in the family, that her father still had some big money that he had to pay back. And at a time like this, everyone needs to be together, because there is no one to support the father. They are going back to Russia, and now the father will work there. Nancy did not remember her homeland. She only realized that her life would change completely. Maybe if she had been older, she would have borne it harder. But youth is greedy for impressions, and Nancy didn't mind seeing the world. It was a shame to part with her friends, but she thought she'd go to a school like this one back in her hometown. Yeah, now things had changed more than she could have imagined. Finding herself in an ordinary Russian school, Nancy felt like an alien. The first time it was so hard for her that, in the evenings, shutting herself in her room, she cried something she had long since gotten used to. Only when she was very small had she shed tears like that. After Nancy, evaluating her, in general, not bad class and girls not at all mean, moderately mocking them, and up to passionately curious, and boys who clumsily tried to woo the English girl, who spoke with an accent, and most of all the teacher of Russian language and literature, for whom they did not come up with a better banal definition of a teacher from God. But that's what everyone called her. She loved both her subject and her children selflessly. In short, after a while everything at Nancy's was back to normal. Not like at home. They returned to the very apartment from which they had left for England, and Molly, looking around confusedly, the dwelling seemed to her unusually uncozy and cramped and there was still all the stuff they'd brought with them. Molly realized that there was nothing new to buy. Her husband didn't work for a while. Later he took a low-level job in banking again. The neighborhood. All young people. And he started drinking, and in a way he remembered his past faster than his wife, and realized that expensive cognacs and the like were no longer for him. After all, if you drink every day and not just occasionally, you will spend a fortune on elite drinks, and where to get it. Hot drinks were required every day. And if there was nothing at home, it was a dead evening. Dad figured it out real quick. Maybe he had a family history of alcoholics. Molly, on the other hand, was genuinely lost. She bought seemingly familiar groceries, 
but maybe he gave her only nothing for the household. And money that should have been stretched over a week was gone in a day. Instead of promising that things would get better, my husband said to cook something simple, like dumplings. You should have seen the sight. When in the evening at dinner my father sits at the table, there is an honorable bottle of vodka, and my mother comes in with that confused smile, which is now as if glued to her face, and puts on the table a soup full of steaming dumplings. She made them herself, yes, from three kinds of meat. But from her point of view, she has absolutely nothing to eat herself, because those salads and those fruits, which are useful for beauty, are now relegated to the realm of legend. Mom had to master oatmeal and apples bought from grandmothers at the market. But what tormented her even more was that before she had lived in name. Her husband was everything to her. Now there seemed to be no one to talk to. Alex came, ate and slept, and fell asleep early before 10 o'clock, and at night he was tormented by insomnia. He would shuttle to the kitchen and back, looking for pills for his head, and then pour himself a shot again, because he couldn't sleep. And they you rush, you won't be able to work, he explained to his wife. When she shrank to the left, exactly sick asked him maybe enough. In the morning, the father got up, detached and age, put on the main shirt, which Molly served, shaking hands to tie his tie. At the bank, he was already careful not to show it to customers. Nancy missed the moment when her parents decided to separate. They never fought in front of her. Her mother felt that her daughter should not be psychologically traumatized. Nancy was appealing to a new world for herself, and the final exams were ahead. Clara practiced with her additionally at her home, and did not charge a penny for it. In that sense, she was a fossilized element. But the biggest shock Nancy had to endure was when the last exam was passed, and quite decently. It seemed to the girl that now she was going to have a series of holidays. There would be some kind of present for successful completion of school. Then the birthday of 18 years. Then she and the girls will apply to the university. And then dad and mom call her into dad's office, close the door behind them. Daddy doesn't look like himself. In the time they've been back from England, he's aged 20 years. Mommy doesn't look like herself either. She's as beautiful, gentle, and well-groomed as a house cat. But there's a nervousness about her. He twirls the pen, then puts it away, then picks it up again and starts twirling it. We want you to get married in a month, Mom said. And again, please. It was so wild and impossible that Nancy asked, and if you could, spell it again. The thing is, I'm getting married soon too, Mom said. Nancy didn't know what to do clear her ears, support her dropping jaw, cover her face with her hands. Mom explained. She had met a man. Or rather, a man had met her. Mom always took the second role. She didn't say, I've always met a man. I was introduced, beckoned, proposed to, charmed. Nancy thought once again that in the East she would not have been valued. So Mama was met and charmed and charmed to the point of madness by her. So she was getting married. Mama didn't add, and Nancy didn't ask. She just assumed Mama would have a life like before, or maybe even better. Sailing caviar, silver roots. In short, the family was breaking up, and Nancy urgently needed a place to go, to shelter her daughter in a safe harbor. Mom, this is the 20th century. Nancy was so stunned that she almost forgot the Russian words. She wanted to switch to English. I'm going to college. I'm moving to a dorm or an apartment with girls, and I'm going to visit my dad. Your boyfriend, as I understand, does not want to see me. Mom patiently sighed and shook her beautiful lips. Then she explained she had pulled up all her connections, kin to three generations, grandniece, great-niece, great-nephew, stepdaughters. But she'd found an absolutely marvelous match. 39 years old, single, rich, already seen Nancy's picture and invited to dinner on Sunday. Nancy thought that if daddy drank, then mommy must have been into drugs and not exactly light, maybe even heavy. An overdose, you'll be home on Sunday. Mom folded her arms across her chest, thin white fingers, manicure, 
stylish rings. Nancy was going on a bike ride with the girls this weekend. Now the plans seemed to be shutting down. Of course, it was possible to run away from the apartment unnoticed in the morning and rush to the girls and ride already from them. But suddenly the weather turned bad, as if it were at the same time with mom. And on Saturday my father's blood pressure went up, and to leave him to listen to my mother's lamentations, if she ran away. Anyway, the girl stayed. And as in the good old days, she and her mother prepared Sunday dinner and set the oval table with the finest embroidered tablecloth, and laid out the dishes according to the rules. And when the bell rang and her mother threw her daughter out to open the door, Nancy realized to hell with the bicycle, to hell with the girls, and the institution, for that matter. Because the Michael her mom had chosen was only ironically a high-end furniture salesman. He should have been starring in blockbuster movies or gracing the covers of men's magazines. Or Nancy shook his head, once again replacing the English vocabulary in it with Russian. And he was not only handsome, but also charming and smart. In short, Nancy didn't even marry with a whistle. It was a sort of teleportation. Today she is a schoolgirl, teaching graphing functions and sleeping under her favorite climate plate. Tomorrow she's a young wife in her own home. Nancy ordered prints of her wedding photos, framed them and hung them on the wall so she could look at them 100 times a day and remind herself that it wasn't all a dream. She didn't turn out anywhere near the kind of hostess my mom did, but she didn't need to be. Michael didn't demand a fine table or an impeccably put-together house, but he loved to travel and they often went somewhere, mostly abroad, to Europe. That's where Nancy's language test came in handy. Michael's command of English was much worse, but still decent. True, their trips were not purely recreational. Business, you know. Suppliers of wood compote. Try saying that name. Maybe it's the only one on the planet that grows the headsets that belong in a palace, not in the homes of mere mortals. Michael was in love with his work, sensing that he could get some rarity. He could go anywhere and anytime, even to the end of the world. There were times when her husband was away on business all day, but Nancy was never bored. They always stayed in hotels that were miniature cities. They had everything in them, and new acquaintances happened every time by themselves. And how many young women did Nancy envy when Michael was around? More than once or twice. The women would try to recall the wrinkles, the forehead. I think I saw him in some movie. He wasn't a musician, or maybe a singer. How many countries did they travel to? How many things did they see? Nancy grinned. And then, if it hadn't been for Cindy investigator Cindy Jabrailova, she wouldn't have been able to glue her life together from the shards. Yeah, that's too bad. What's broken will never be whole again. But this damn survival instinct makes you collect these shards, try them on each other, try to attach them, glue them, realizing that just one easy movement is enough to cost fate, as they say, a little finger to move. Cindy knows that now Nancy has a different name, different paperwork. What made her turn a blind eye? The parents don't know where Nancy is now. All they know is that she's alive. Mom, drowning in her new happy life, Diving headfirst into it, and even with her hair up high, is content with that too. Father has drunk himself completely to death. Sometimes Nancy calls him to say I'm doing well. And Camille, Nancy's daughter, is 12 years old. But she's got a lot of self-importance. She's 16 too. Will you even come to my funeral? Dad asks, like, jokingly. But they both know he doesn't have long to live. My liver's gone to hell. I wish I had that much to drink. What if I ask you the same question? Nancy holds his breath. You don't say anything. It's scary to imagine such a thing. So do I. What are you comparing? Generational change is natural. Fuck you with those words. Nancy hangs up the phone. But dad realizes it's the snowiest thing in the world. I love you. After leaving the phone booth, Nancy walks into a bar. On principle, she can't afford to spend too much. But not now. She orders a cognac, a double shot, refuses the lemon, 
peanuts and other nonsense the bartender offers. She will drink, sitting at the nearly empty bar in the darkest corner. The waiter will come over to light a candle on the table, but she will make the gesture don't, and he'll leave her alone. Maybe they'll stay in this town for a while, as long as no one sniffs about them. The daughter even liked the apartment. What are they renting on quiet old street? There's a bakery on the first floor. You can get a cup of coffee there in the morning. And at nights the female sleeps soundly and doesn't see the cockroaches that scurry across the kitchen floor, not ineradicable. Nancy has experienced everything and almost gives up. Evelyn will leave for school in the morning. And Nancy will open her laptop and sit down to work. And maybe pour themselves another shot of cognac. Heredity, good sirs and life in the realm of horror, and the glass is already empty. Michael did a lot of charity work. It's a badge of honor among the well-to-do. Some may have felt sorry for the money, but didn't want to be judged by others. And for some, it became a need. Michael chose a children's rehabilitation center. It was something between a boarding school and an orphanage. It's where the kids went. In layman's terms, from dysfunctional families, they lived there for a month two or three months. They were treated, fed, tried to learn something. As a rule, these kids were very poor in their studies. For some kids during this time, everything changed for the better in the family. Parents would get coded, get a job. Then the kids would come home. If parents continued to drink, stab each other, and there was nothing to hang a mouse on in the refrigerator, the kids were sent to an orphanage. The rehabilitation center Michael saw looked extremely shabby. Over the years that the businessman was his patron, the institution has been transformed. Renovation, a huge plasma TV palace, in the game rooms toys, and a playground. On the walls were now painted fairy tale characters. Fresh fruit appeared on the tables, and the headmistress greeted Michael with such reverence. That's right, he was an Arab sheik, and she was his latest beggar. Nancy, too, had the joy of participating in all this. Many times she went to the stores to pick out a toy for one of the birthday boys herself, a dress-up doll, or a huge bear, or a wind-up train. And her new friends advised her to give Michael a baby of his own. He'd be a wonderful father. Nancy was a little afraid. Her mother told her that she had carried her only pregnancy extremely hard. She was lying in the bed, she was turned inside out almost until the birth, and she did not know what she wanted parents to die. There were moments when the second option seemed preferable, especially if it came right away. So when she tested positive, Nancy literally prepared herself to wait for the end. But pregnancy caused her only three inconveniences. She constantly wanted to sleep, and Nancy hated the smell of cinnamon and peppermint. It's nothing to take into account. Looking ahead, a persistent aversion to the memory persisted for life. Unlike the chicken, Michael asked if Nancy wanted to give birth in a private maternity hospital, but the young woman chose a regular one. At the district hospital, everyone said that the doctors there were very good, experienced, and even the most complicated cases ended well. But when three days before Nancy put the ward, it was paid, it is yes, and the doctors were discussing labor options, the young woman was in favor of a C-section with both hands. It seemed less scary to her. Later she realized that there are no easy surgeries in principle, and if the anesthetic injection is delayed even 10 minutes, you will feel like a little run over by a train. But Galka was lying next to her, the living example. Skinny as a wall, she tried to get up sideways, sideways from the very beginning. I didn't moan or complain. In general, in that run on the floor was a lot of operated, and cheerful elderly nurse at six o'clock shouted in the corridor, but what? Go wash. That was all secondary, though. The important thing was that Nancy had a baby girl, pretty as a doll. You could enter her in the Miss Baby contest. The name was Michael's choice, and he wouldn't let Nancy settle on any name suggested. Nonsense, mother. He said gently. As for luxury names, they used to be given to their children by the Blattened, and now by soap opera fans, and the folk versions. Before, Daddy was asked to find a baby a prettier name, 
like the gentleman. Let's focus on noble families. Let's keep up the good manners. Nancy, while she was reading to her daughter, didn't listen too much to what her husband was saying. In fact, she didn't care as long as she didn't get sick. Michael hired an au pair. An elderly pleasant woman came for a few hours a day, made the house cozy, filled the refrigerator. And it seemed to Nancy that even though she had warm conditions, she was still a zombie compared to the other women. Evelyn lay awake at night like in the movie from dusk till dawn. Nancy wandered around the house with her so the little girl wouldn't disturb her husband. And during the day, Nancy went from room to room with ampulla eyes and often clung to corners. Her parents would come over to see their granddaughter. Strange, and I was sure you'd have a boy, said the father. At least one in our family. I thought the ultrasound said so. They're often wrong. I like your house, mom said. It has a face. Michael is good. He appreciates things so much, he chooses them so carefully. Every table has a personality. It's all the rage these days to have apartments as impersonal as spaceships. It looks like an astronaut is about to swim into the room, push open the door of a secret closet, and pull out a spare spacesuit. But Nancy could not, like her mother, turn into a housefly, or rather, a smokefly. And when Alex grew up, Nancy started drawing. It was kind of unbeknownst to her. She'd never been to art school or even a studio before. And then her soul asked for creativity. Nancy bought some paint-by-numbers pictures of brightly colored parrots and a ship against the sunset. Mom had never heard of this kind of painting before. With a twinkle in her eye, she decided that her daughter had awakened a talent. Well, it's all right if you slept a long time. Vaughn, Susan Boyle, at 47 years old, went on stage, sang with an angelic voice, and everyone went down. I mean, they stood up and gave her a standing ovation. Maybe there was a repin in her daughter, too. And life was finally pushing him around. Nancy was amused. She tried to explain to her mom it was like embroidering a pattern. But for one thing, mom was in a hurry to get to the hairdressers, and she didn't have time to listen. Second, she wanted to believe in miracles. And then Nancy brought home a third canvas and small plastic cans of paint. It was going to be beautiful a winter night, a starry sky, a hut with a lighted window, a black forest in the distance, and a black fence. Pisanka was playing in the playpen with her cubs. Nancy picked up the brush, but in that instant she stopped realizing that the clearly defined borders on the diagram had been drawn and the numbers had changed shape, merging into something else. She drew quickly, her hand was wildly accurate. Not once did the brush waver. She didn't even have to look at the numbers if she read them from the jar. And at the same time she experienced a feeling that had never come to her before. That joy and awe, bordering on fear, that convinced her subconscious that something was being born from beneath my hands. Something more than I could. Still she felt dizzy, and God knows how it would have ended. But in fact it had run out of paint, two cans of black and blue were empty, and the rest stood almost untouched. Nancy, shaking her head. What a winter, what a cottage. There was no cabin in sight. Before her on the canvas was the corner of some dirty barn, and a boy thin to the blue, with bell-bottomed, dirty hair. She had never been able to draw a boy cat, would not have been able to draw much less a man. Nancy flung the canvas away from her, tossing it like a living thing. She didn't hang this painting on the wall. She slid it into a corner in her studio, covered it with sheets of absorbent cotton. But painting was becoming a need for Nancy, moreover, an addiction. The kind of withdrawal that happens without cigarettes, without the internet. With Nancy without something to leave a mark on and something to leave a mark on, she began to catch herself sketching some scenes in pencil on wallpaper in the margins of magazines with her finger on the window. They had a girl like Kathy at school. Every time a lesson turned out to be boring, Kathy drew on the last pages of her notebooks and drew exclusively high-heeled shoes, stiletto heels, high as stilts. The shoes were rose-colored or bowed with leopard or snake bows, but Kathy was drawn to graceful ladies' shoes. It was an excuse for her to keep her hands and mind busy. What about Nancy? 
What about shoes and bows? She herself was frightened by the drawings, as if something was appearing on the other side of the sheet that was staring her in the eye. Some male faces, sweat, compressed lips, a piercing gaze, possessed, devoid of pity, hands clenched into fists, some slums, and a screaming woman. Nancy made an appointment with a therapist. He was a short man with a red beard. Nancy later learned that he hated women. It happens. He always blames women for everything. They go away after their sessions, snot on their fist, and ashes on their heads. Nancy, Rick considered it a minor case. Enroll in an art studio, he advised. Let them teach you to paint what you like, and don't you try to do some housework. You must have neglected your husband with his laws. There was a group of amateur and novice painters in town. In the summer, we'd make arrangements and go out together on plain air. It was noisy and fun. The attention of spectators was not embarrassing, and the works were then brought to mind and exhibited. Nancy joined this company, left her nanny to the loom, and went with the artists to paint the half-ruined manor house. She hoped that in the presence of other people her hand, which had a life of its own, would behave decently. Everything started out splendidly. The young people were given a tour of the manor, fed a hot lunch in the school canteen, and led to a clearing where the desired view opened up. Create, Nancy, please, said Nancy to herself. She had all she needed paint, canvas, and a shift in her mind. She began to paint as carefully as if she were drunk, but there was no way she could show it. Great, already the walls were outlined, plaster shaken, windows without panes, empty dark openings, tall grass that joined the dying house. Nancy started late to pour. She wanted to finish sooner to get away from the canvas, as if it was cold here, near it. But take two steps to the side, and it's a hot summer day again. Oh, said Jenna from over my shoulder. Who do you have? Jenna was sort of the unspoken leader of their group. She'd been drawing for a long time. Sketching was quick and easy. She was clearly talented. Now she lived behind the artists and watched to see who was doing what. Nancy looked at her work and barely refrained from forcing again your mother. Yes, it was an old gentleman's house, perfectly rendered. Only there, it was by no means the height of day in the painting, but early twilight and black window openings ruled. And in the far right someone was there, someone standing in the depths of the room barely recognizable, and in the darkness only the eyes were clearly visible. Maybe the last light was falling on them. The eyes attracted and beckoned. Jenna was silent for a few seconds. It's kind of creepy, she said. Maybe you do not only draw, but also horror stories. What then we will sell these pictures that we paint nowadays? And you know, but don't take offense, I wouldn't buy yours. I think if it hung in my room overnight, those eyes would glow. Changed her last name, middle name. She kept her name. True, no man ever called her Nancy. But Nancy was what was left of her old life. She wanted to get a license to carry at least a limited firearm. It was vital, and she was saving up the money. The only thing was to make sure it wasn't to the detriment of her posture. In the meantime, she went to the shooting range. At first she had to drive quite far, but then she got lucky. There was a park near their house and there suddenly opened a small shooting gallery, which worked every day, even on weekends. At first, the owner was surprised by it unspeakably. Boys came to him, and sometimes girls and men came in, amusing themselves or proving to themselves that they are still wow. But this strange woman, who came here almost every day, and every time took a rifle with such a look, as if it was the main thing in her life. At first, she was a private, a beginner and often missed very often. Then the holes in the target began to get closer and closer to the black center until finally they began to converge there and merge into each other. One day another regular at the shooting range asked Nancy, are you an athlete or just nuts? She didn't answer anything, just looked at him intently. About a week after that they found themselves near each other again in a small pavilion. This uncle was inferior to Nancy in marksmanship but not by much. Have you got any money? 
He asked carelessly between two shots. Do you want to rob? She inquired, noting the different tone of voice. Now he was talking. Hard like that. Think about asking a second time have you bought anything for yourself yet? The uncle asked. But there are decent traumatics. We're just looking at them. Nancy, testing, looked at him. I mean, maybe you want something more serious. He asked nonchalantly. That's why I'm wondering how much you're looking for. Nancy put the rifle down and nodded at the door. Let's go out and talk. Christina knew her lover had a wife. Her heart ached, but it was bearable for now. I am a modern woman. That was the mantra. Perhaps repeating it 200 times would make it easier. But there's a wife out there in her own world. Home, baby, pacifiers, diapers. The wife will be there. And Christina will be here. And everything's fine. The chances of them crossing paths were practically nil. In the big city with the lifestyle Nancy led. Ugh. What kind of fossil name is she? No common acquaintances. Christina recently moved to a new neighborhood, bought a studio. She's a designer. Adds charm to faceless housing. Roughly speaking, she makes a little candy out of nothing. She and Michael are past and future. Does he have any Marie Antoinette tricks? She's got tomorrow. In the mornings, Christina went to the window where the sun poured in. No curtains. 24th floor, with only the sky above, and the birds at arm's length. Soon something will be invented, and it will be possible to open the window to fly with the birds. That's not to say Christina didn't dream of what could be, but all dreams extended to the short term. Michael said tomorrow, we will go to a concert, to an exhibition, to a restaurant. He realized Christina in four walls to lock up ridiculous as a bird sometimes sounded. We'll fly to the sea or go on a cruise always, no longer than a week. Christina didn't guess. She knew that at home Michael talked about business trips and suppliers. And Nancy, busy with the babies, didn't give a damn where he was going. The head assistant came in every day. Christina was not the kind of girl for whom luxury and happiness are equaled. She valued impressions above all else. And if standing on board of a cruise ship, she stopped with delight. Admiring the northern lights, she, in general, it did not care whether her cabin was luxurious or not. Working with interiors and things, she was at the same time as if she was above it, honoring the power of nature, works of art, human feelings. However, Michael was not stingy at all. He gave her gifts very often. Christina's apartment and closet were replenished with many beautiful things, and she in her most secret dreams saw that one day he would buy a house in the woods by the lake. A house of wood and glass unlike anything her imagination had created. A house not even from the 21st century, but probably from the 22nd. The only thing that was incomprehensible about Michael was his attitude toward children. It was logical to think that he wouldn't leave Nancy because they had a daughter. But he never spoke to Evelyn, never mentioned her name. There wasn't a single picture of Michael with a baby girl in his arms in his phone. One time when Christina started questioning him, he asked her back, why would you do that? Are you trying to tell me you're seriously interested in my baby or jealous of me? You can't love her. She's my wife's daughter. Just don't go playing all goofy and fawning over pictures of the girl. The truth is, you wish she wasn't here. That's it. It's been like that ever since. But Michael talked about these parish children willingly and a lot. He talked about the new girls and boys at the rehabilitation center. He often went to see the kids, mentioned when he had managed to arrange someone's fate. It was all incomprehensible. But Michael had never fully opened his soul to anyone, and Christina only had to put up with the brackets of the man she loved. This week he told her again, a weekend away to the seaside. He never gave her much notice. At least she didn't have to think about anything. Tickets, hotels all appeared exactly by themselves, as if by magic. The only question Christina had was how many days to take things for. Of course, it was inconvenient. It was not uncommon to have to explain force majeure to clients, sorry, humbly, without going into details. The lover called. I can't refuse. 
Michael never talked about the house, although he often remarked in passing that they should not hide anything from each other. But he was hiding a great deal. Christina had realized it that very evening by the sea. Hell knows why this trip had turned out so well. Only three days absolutely and out of season. November and Russia. What to do in Russia in November by the sea? In a small hotel where students should live because it is about to close for the winter. In the meantime, there is a heater like a breeze. And for entertainment, counting the flies that died between the frames. But these three days have been crazy, beautiful. While it was light, Michael and Christina wandered along the shore and went far beyond all the wild beaches and the sea that doesn't care that the world is in the month of fall. The sea, which hadn't lost an ounce of its charms, lavished them with gifts that there was no one to collect now. All these shells are refugees of the depths. Christina could pour over them for hours. They sat in a cafe on the deserted, almost waterfront, or on the adjacent street, where in summer there is no crowding. The menu was sparse. Maybe the hosts did not expect guests at all, but they received Christina and Michael not even as guests, but as distant relatives, perhaps. They carried everything they could treat themselves to and fish fry for themselves, and homemade wine, and bubbles, and buttery chepericks, which a minute ago were grumbling in the pans. Michael tasted wine and invariably took a bottle with him. If it was a clear, starry night, they stood on the balcony for long periods of time. It overlooked the forest. There was nothing to fear that anyone would see cold, but they could get back into their blankets. They drank wine from the simple granite glasses that were in the room with the wine. And the huge southern stars, especially bright from the light frost, were moving away and closer, almost touching their faces. And if it rained, they drank wine in bed and listened to the noise outside the window. And there was the safest harbor in the world between the blanket and Michael's body. Christina did not breathe and this harbor happiness overwhelmed her, and she was afraid that she would leave with her breath, dissolve into the air, and the night would end. Usually no one called Michael. Christina didn't understand how it was possible. So if Michael disappeared from her life, she wouldn't notice it at all, just as long as he sent money. Christina wanted to call and offer Nancy a payoff, but there was an invisible line she shouldn't cross. Asking Michael about the shared house to pay Nancy for it was not an option, and yet she was infinitely surprised when his phone suddenly rang at 200 hours. They were still awake, though the bottle was almost empty. And this time, it wasn't wine, but tincture. Christina's eyes were already draining, and Michael seemed to be just really drunk. He reached for his phone, glanced at the number, and answered it immediately. Then he went into the bathroom and closed the door behind him. He came out five minutes later. Christina had been flirting the whole time. Not a word, not a sound. She hadn't been around at all. But now she asked in a falsely sympathetic tone, what's the matter with your daughter sick? Burned out, Michael said. He seemed to want to punch her with his fist then bullocks with excess of feeling. He was glowing with joy as Christina sat down, ready to share in his celebration. Dan, there was almost nothing left. Michael flipped the bottle over his glass, and there's nowhere to take more until morning. You don't leave me anything yourself. I'm wasted and fuming as it is. So what happened? Maybe if it hadn't been for that particular moment, she wouldn't have known anything for a long time. But it all came together. Christina listened. She was lying under a warm blanket, but her hands and feet had become icy cold. And when Michael, in turn, fell asleep, she somehow got to the balcony, hung over the railing, and vomited for a long time on the flying lilac bushes. Luxury furniture is priceless antiques, you say. Ha ha. Three times. Nobody needs them, those kids, Michael said in a memorized voice. I always know before they're brought in that they'll be taken away from home to this very orphanage. If it's something worthwhile, then it's easier this way. Like they run away from home, and that's it. That's it, that's all they'll whistle or the money's gone. You know how many of these bids go missing every year. Where? All over the country. And from their own alcoholic parents, that's a godsend. And if it's something really big, 
It's crazy. Once in 100 years, a boy is like an angel, a girl like a doll, then you can get one from an orphanage. I'm sorry, they're not torn either. Things happen, lost just like that. Where are they going? I didn't know if she was saying that or someone else. Into good hands, Michael said in the same confident drunken voice. What do you think? I boil them in butter and pepper them just as good as they were. They won't be. What do you want? You want me to tell you all the schemes? It's a brandy thing. I thought the organs. Christina's voice got all thin. A squeak, not a voice. Come on, it's rare, rare, Michael reassured her. I've done it a couple times, just not chicky chicky usually. One time, and anyway, there was this tiny Botticelli painting. His hair was below his knees. Three years old is also a piece of cake. And they themselves, of course, I only drive bridges. There were others watching. Mother turned away in the store, and did she disappear at all? It happens. And where is she now? In a good country. Favored daughter. Michael said it with such pride, as if it were his own daughter. She's probably forgotten her hometown 100 years ago. Little ones have short memories. The Glock turned out to be a great gun, though Nancy gave a sum worth mentioning for it, and for Dizzy. The gun had two hiding places, one in the car and one in the house. Nancy understood the dangers of illegal possession, but she wasn't going to reach for the Glock until the last minute and then she wouldn't care about anything else as long as they stayed alive, or at least the sled. Nancy couldn't relax for a minute because of her daughter, and the female was getting harder and harder to handle. In this school she was in now, the girl was new. It was hard to get acclimated, it took time. And when the class was embroiled in a story, newbies are best suited to be scapegoats. In this case, goats. Young guys from some developmental center came to the school with some kind of program or project Nancy didn't get into all that, she didn't care. Much worse, it was all about her daughter. The young educators had to give a few lectures, show slides. I guess it seemed like career guidance after all. And it had to happen that the girls fell in love with one of them, who was particularly good looking. Nick Alex, she had nothing to do with it. But that bunch of girls who ran the class, accustomed to the attention of the guys, the girls had no doubt that they would have an easy success here too. They began to flirt with the teacher, giggled, asked provocative questions, stuck notes in his jacket pocket. They would have loved to dress up and sit down, as at a disco, but they realized that in such a form the director would not let them beyond the locker room. And then the bags in their teeth and behind the parents. So then one of these girls right at the lecture, when the guy was standing between desks, put her palm on the back pocket of his jeans and slightly squeezed. At this point, the young man's patience ran out. He went to the principal and asked to be excused from that class. Emily's, old school ladies, even Shannon stood up in dismay. The class teacher and both head teachers, the school psychologist, the parents and the ladies from the police were immediately on the alert. Put everyone on the register and all the way to graduation. That was the least the girls were firmly promised. The female, who due to the peculiarities of her biography, not only was not friends with boys, but in general shunned all representatives of the male sex, was afraid of them and did not trust them, now fell under the crush. The very girl who had done all this sodding so that she was burnt with water. Claimed Alex put her up to it. No, she didn't go easy on him. Promised her 5,000 bucks for that kind of fun. And the girl needed the money badly. Daddy got fired from his job, family starving at home. So I had to take her up on it. Stupidly, of course. Stupidly. Forgive me for being a fool. This version of the girl voiced in the office of the director. Immediately, the female was summoned there when she heard what she was accused of. She was so blown away that she threw herself into agony right in front of Emily. Fury empowered the female threw the girl to the floor and began beating her fists fiercely. Nothing like this had ever happened in the principal's office before. What's there to register? The victim's mother took her daughter to the hospital for evaluation. Nancy was tracked down by telephone 
and told to report to school in a quarter of an hour. Emily probably thought that Nancy would be even more horrified than she was and would burst into tears, simultaneously shaming her daughter and begging for her forgiveness. I can do that. When Nancy entered the study where the solemn judgment was being prepared, the only thing she could see was that she was very tired, dead tired, nothing else. Do you realize what Camille has done? Her parents are going to sue you and the school. The press will be here today, never before, not even the boys. Nancy stood and waited for that goal of outraged voices to be silenced. She would be heard. She didn't wait. Took a piece of paper out of her pocket, unfolded it, and laid it on the table. Here's the application I'm taking from the school. She was offended by what a classmate accused her of. And this girl will suffer no consequences except bruises. I believe that's called a minor injury. How much do her parents want? Now, unfortunately, honor issues are solved by money, and we will file a countersuit for slander and moral damage. When they drove home to 40, really looked guilty. We'll have to leave again because of me. Nancy sighed. We will, but you're not the main reason. Tell me, what happened? Asked her daughter. You'll be fine. So it's him again. And Alex stared out the window. Both of them realized what was waiting for them. They would have to pack their things very quickly, in a matter of hours, and take train tickets with a transfer, or even two. He was seen in a neighboring town. Investigator Cindy Jabrelova told Nancy on the phone this morning. But why? Why didn't you catch him then and give him a life sentence? Both realized the question was rhetorical. Cindy and her assistants had done everything they could. Wasn't there a worse time to get pregnant? No, there wasn't. There was no more inopportune man to have a child with. Christina stared at the test and felt for herself what a stupid expression she now had on her face. And yet she was still hoping for a possible mistake. A test bought at the drugstore. And she compared it without realizing it to an inexperienced medical professional who only assumes but is not sure of anything. She made an appointment with the city's best gynecologist for an appointment that cost a fortune. She didn't care. The appointment was a week in advance. Seven days sounded ominous, like the movie The Call. With great difficulty, Christina managed to focus on work, on these projects that could never be abandoned. When the order somehow managed to finish, the girl went around the room clasping her hands and something silently whispered, mouth, as if begging for something fate. Only one percent. She allowed herself to get rid of the child. Christina herself was given to her mother with great difficulty. A fictitious child. Long years of infertility treatment, when everything was put into motion. Parents turned to professors and grandmothers to drown. 100,000 sanatoriums, depression, attempted suicide, and finally, the long-awaited pregnancy, which could be terminated at any moment. Mom was on the reservation from the very beginning to the last day. And still Christina was born seven months old. The girl imagined that something like this could happen in her life. God forbid, she would have been ready Though yesterday she had not thought about it yet, to bring up this child alone, oh, she would have raised him. She would have had enough strength, time, money, and most importantly, love. But there was no hope that Michael would accept her decision and leave her alone. It was a trait of his character. He believed that what was mine was mine. I would not give it to anyone. And she was his girlfriend, and the child, in his opinion, would not belong to her mother, but primarily to him. Fate often suggests the answer to the question, what should I do? In an indirect, veiled way. So it happened, and with benefit. She went to the paid clinic as if she were going to be executed. And she was very surprised to see an old lady in line in front of her. Christina thought that only well-to-do ladies, for whom nothing is more important than their own health, were sitting here. No, there was an ordinary grandmother about 80 years old, thin and haggard. Her daughter brought her. She, of course, paid for the appointment, judging by how poorly the woman was dressed. It was a gesture of desperation. It is not known whether she would have come here for treatment or not, but she was willing to give her mother her last penny. Wendy was said to be a miracle worker, 
taking on almost hopeless cases. Christina entered the room after the grandmother was taken out, and from the scraps of conversation between the doctor and the nurse she realized that there was nothing that could be done, only relief. It was as if death had breathed on Christina. And when Wendy confirmed that she was pregnant, suddenly, for the first time in these nightmarish days, the girl was overcome with joy. The life she was now glimpsing was leaving, and there was no power to hold it back. But the new life was breaking into the light, and it was quite impossible to destroy it. Thank you very much, Christina said. No, if everything will be all right, I will be observed not in a paid, but in a regular consultation. Thank you. It sounded so sincere that the doctor's usual mask of sternness disappeared for a few seconds. Wendy smiled. Good luck to you. Now it was necessary to do perhaps the most important thing to slip away from Michael so inconspicuously, so that he would not go bankrupt, would not obstruct. Christina decided to walk like a swamp, proding the ground in front of her. She didn't answer his calls right away. Sometimes she didn't pick up the phone at all and the latter returned his calls, hoping to accustom him to this new attitude. Not right away, but he felt it. Didn't you have another lover, or am I boring? He asked, as if in jest. Or do you have a schedule now? Today one, and tomorrow another. You're talking nonsense. What schedule? She did feel tired, but now she tried to make sure it was reflected in her voice. Unloaded to the brim with work from the top, if you have the ability and desire to verify what I say, verify it. Michael brushed it off, but Christina knew he would not miss the chance to check. A few days later, he brought up the subject again. When she refused to keep him company at a country restaurant, why do you write so much? Do you want to earn money for what? Christina was making extraordinary progress in the art of lying. She shrugged, but you know, basically, I have my own life. It's not like I'm going to demand that you get a divorce and do everything I want. I'm going to support myself. I want a country house, a computer, a minimum of 1,000 for 200 clients will travel, and I will work at home. I can see hotels with panoramic windows. Behind them, snow-covered coniferous forest. There's a fire burning in the fireplace. And I'll come to you. It sounded half a question, of course. You know I'm not focused on men, I'm focused on work. So hearing you talk about cheating is ridiculous to me. Christina was calculating her next steps. She didn't want to leave the big city, and she hadn't thought about it until recently. But if she had to, her father, mother, and elderly grandmother lived pretty far away. She would say that grandma needed to be cared for. You can't entrust an old lady into someone else's hands. If she wants to, let her check on her. Grandma lives separately. She is already 86. And of course, at this age, there are no healthy. And the granddaughter's help is simply necessary. And yes, Christina will really go away. Mom always said if her daughter was going to have a baby for herself, she'd take it. And I don't care if it's from a Negro or a Chinese or the president of France. Mom added, emphasizing the extent of her selflessness. And then the day came when Christina came home, and Michael was waiting for her, lying on the couch. He had had the key to her apartment for a long time, but lying there, doing nothing. It was so rare that Christina thought he was even sick and wanted to stay with me so as not to infect the household. Why didn't you tell me you were pregnant? Michael asked. As something insignificant, Christina took off her boots in the hallway. She froze dreading that moment when she would accelerate and face him. At last, she managed to control herself. How do you know? She asked. She took the grocery bag into the kitchen and began to sort through its contents, taking her time. Some for the fridge, some for the cupboard. Didn't I tell you? Don't even try to hide things from me. You have to say things like that. There's nothing to talk about yet. It's still a symbolic term. I get it. You haven't decided what to do with the baby yet. But don't even think about getting rid of it. I'm guessing you don't want him. In that case, treat him like a commodity, a very expensive commodity. It's all pretty straightforward. When her eyes widened in horror, 
That's something she couldn't have thought of. Could you treat your child like that yourself? He grinned. You should know what I'm up to. Christina closed her eyes and leaned against the wall to keep from falling. It had happened on the most ordinary day. The female was going into first grade then, and Nancy was all nervous, even though the school was close by and the kids could come home on their own. The parents of the little ones crowded at the classroom door long before the last class was over to pick up their children. There was nothing to sit on, but mothers and grandmothers stood in a tight circle and discussed, discussed, discussed. Everything seemed terribly important what copybooks to buy, who and where took a physical education uniform, school meals, crumbs, first friendships and first feuds. They strayed from one topic to another, and when finally the bell rang and among the other guys came out tired, Nancy rushed to her with the question, but how? As if her daughter didn't have trivial math behind her, but at least the U.S. Then homework at home, posture always did them under her mother's supervision. Together they collected a backpack for tomorrow, prepared clothes, and it was necessary to put the girl to bed on time, because Alex was not used to get up so early did not fall asleep. For the first time she had shadows under her eyes. In short, the week was exhausting and scary for both of them. And if before they tried to plan something interesting for the weekend, this time Nancy decided not to go anywhere in themselves. We'll have a leisurely breakfast, watch a movie, order a hamburger and ice cream at home. Nancy anticipated that even after lunch it would be possible to take a nap or at least to lie down with a book, to bask in the bath. At that time her ideas of happiness were the simplest. But then Michael called, saying that he was suddenly free and had already taken tickets for some children's play for the evening. When Nancy heard this, her face hid so much that her daughter giggled. Good thing daddy can't see you, she said, but it wasn't theatrical. They were both in the mood. Didn't feel like pulling out the outfits, dad's emergency. Like grandma Nancy used to say, then drive a long way. I didn't want to sit in the audience. I wanted to relax for once. But Nancy knew Michael could insist, so with a sigh, she opened her closet and began going through the racks of dresses. They didn't have a lot of clothes. Nancy wasn't much into fashion or dressing up. Evelyn didn't care much for bows and bars at that point. Michael was to pick them up at five o'clock. It was just about to rain. It was starting to get damp, and it would have been so nice to stay home. But who knew that fate would grant their wish in the most unexpected way? When the doorbell rang, Nancy was surprised. Michael had never before forgotten to take the key. But when she saw blood on the doorstep of the not-so-young policeman, an accident, Michael was dead. If he had been alive, she would have gotten a call from the hospital. There was not a shadow of sympathy on the faces of the policemen, however. They had come for Michael and she had been forced to let them into the house to make sure he was gone and had been gone since morning. Nancy followed them as they went around the rooms. What happened? He hit someone. It was the first thing that came to her mind. If he hadn't been hit, then he might even be dead or some kind of business problem. But then do the police suddenly show up at a house like this? She didn't understand much about any of this. But it seemed to her that if there were any financial problems, Michael should have been sent a paper or invited somewhere. You're coming with us, one of the policemen said. What about the baby? Nancy was confused. How long is this going to take? How am I going to leave her? Alone. What's wrong? They'll explain everything to you there. Nancy called a friend and asked her to come and sit with Evelyn until she got back. If it's too late, you can stay the night at my place, but what she learned at the police station was the end of her former life. At a noisy intersection, Michael's car stopped at a red light along with other cars. In the back seat sat a girl of about six or seven years old. The man, who was preparing to cross the road, saw the desperate face of the child, flew to the glass, and the girl, realizing she had been spotted, screamed help. Everything was decided by seconds. The man's reaction was lightning fast. He managed to open the car door, grab the hands of the man behind the wheel. A fight ensued, 
which Michael would no doubt have won. He was younger and considerably stronger, but taking advantage of what was happening, the girl got out of the car and ran into the thick of people, into the yards. Michael slammed the door shut, and the car sped away. The story was absolutely stunning. Nancy. What nonsense, she began. The husband had probably given that girl a ride. And as for the fact that she was calling for help, maybe there's such a family out there ready to blackmail to pay them, fake to kidnapping. The young investigator shook her head. The girl had already been found. She's seven years old. Her mom is a doctor, raising her alone. They were walking in the yard. The mother named her. The neighbor started complaining about her health. So the woman was only distracted for a few minutes, and in that time, the little girl disappeared. But that can't be. Everything that was happening seemed unreal to Nancy. It wasn't Michael. The man who hitched a ride with him got the make and license plate number. This man was hurt too, fortunately, minor bumps, bruises. And the little girl, she didn't get far. According to her, everything happened like this. Her mom was out of sight, and this uncle opened the car door and called her. He said that mom was urgently called to the hospital, and she asked him to bring her daughter to her. The girl was lucky that she quickly realized something was wrong. Another girl would have driven on, hoping she was being taken to her mom. And there's almost a 100% chance the kidnapper would have gotten out of town. The two coincidentally ran a red light, and a stranger rushed to her aid. That's what saved her. Let me tell you something first. Nancy, my husband is not a maniac or a murderer. We have a daughter the same age as that baby. The investigator's girlfriend's voice turned cold. I don't know what the investigation will reveal, but now I wouldn't be surprised if you cover for him. Perhaps you knew about everything in advance. What are you talking about? I'm going to ask you questions, the investigator said, and you will answer them as truthfully as possible. Now the policeman's voice was ice cold. Then sign the report. Nancy was released in the late afternoon. The only way home now was by cab. Up to this point Michael's phone, no matter how many times she called him, had not been answered. But suddenly Nancy heard a familiar tune play in her purse and her husband's number pop up on the screen. But a moment before she bombarded Michael with questions, he said be quiet. Listen to me, because I'm not calling again. I just got unlucky. I took the wrong job. Someone else should have done it. But that's just the way things are. Wait, wait, wait. Don't talk. You're right. I'm not a maniac or a murderer. Children are always okay. Now for a while, everyone's gonna lose me, including you. But I'll come back for you. Don't be afraid of interrogation. You have nothing to say. You really didn't know anything. As the investigation progressed, even those in charge of the investigation became uneasy, even though they were hardened men. It turned out that many were in the business and management in the rehabilitation center and in the orphanage. A peculiar price list was also discovered. Those parents who did not care whether their child would go to the state food or would be sent somewhere abroad received the least. Of course, not all children passed the selection process, and much mattered gender, age, health, and appearance. The case was widely publicized not so much because of children from marginalized families, but because several girls from well-to-do families disappeared. The vain search lasted for years. It cost the parents a lot of money, up to and including the madhouse. And the clue lay close at hand. Now many people have been sentenced, and only Michael has managed to escape. Nancy had already been through a terrible shock. Her family had collapsed. She found herself the wife of an outcast criminal. But that wasn't all. She started receiving anonymous phone calls. She was intercepted at the front door of the house. Your husband robbed us of our daughter. It'll be the same with your girl. We'll give you the last of our money. Hire a man, but be prepared. Although the young woman's psyche was teetering on the brink at the time, she didn't have the luxury of institutionalization. Investigator Cindy, with whom Nancy had interacted more than anyone else during this nightmarish case, 
and who far from immediately believed that the wife was not involved in her husband's affairs, knew nothing about them, gave the go-ahead to leave. Now Nancy remembered with heartache the time, how naive and soft she had been, how she had tried to hope for something good. They hadn't even noticed the tracks. They went to a southern town, but not by the sea, and not in a resort area. To make it cheaper, they rented an apartment. They had the most common surname. Nancy was resting from the fact that the bullying seemed to be over. She worked remotely and in grocery, hardware, and bakery stores. No one was interested in her past. As she settled the girl into school, she explained that the child needed a warm climate. Evelyn is often sick. We decided to try living here. If they like everything, they will sell the old apartment and move permanently. Of course, the old easygoing attitude was gone. Nancy felt guilty in front of the children's parents for loving a man for too long, breaking their lives, trusting him and not noticing anything. And yet it was a reprieve. Evelyn had begun real childhood again, with girlfriends and cartoons, with New Year's parties and princesses and different dresses, with dreams of what would happen tomorrow, in a day in the summer. And Nancy unwittingly made plans too. She really liked the landlord of the apartment she and her daughter rented. He was an old man. He himself lived in a small house on the outskirts of the city and rented the apartment. The one room was clean, with simple repairs and the most necessary furniture. Nancy paid regularly. She and her daughter were quiet tenants, so they had the kindest relations with the landlord. The old man preferred to come for money. In the beginning, he himself did not stay longer than five minutes. He made sure that the apartment and the tenants were all right. He put some bills in his wallet and say goodbye. Then he and Nancy got to talking. From then on, she started inviting Sebastian over for tea. The old man had lived a long life, was a keen beekeeper, and told many interesting stories about the town's past. And when Evelyn at the end of the evening timidly approached him and asked for permission to get a kitten, the old man was quite sympathetic and patted her on the head. You can have a dinosaur. He gave her permission. They had already agreed that it was from Sebastian that Nancy would buy the apartment, for which he was asking a very reasonable sum. And they both got used to the place. And then the phone rang. The number was unfamiliar and Nancy assumed that it was probably from the bank, another amateur credit imposition, or perhaps fraudsters posing as investigators. There were plenty of them now. But when she heard her husband's voice, she almost dropped the cell phone, dropped the call, stood with her heart. Michael called again and again and again until she finally answered, what do you want? He couldn't help but note the hatred that sounded in her voice. His own voice, however, sounded calm and even relaxed. I just missed you. Forget this room and both of us forever. How much grief. Levchenko, listen to me. He continued to speak so serenely, as if it was a question of what to cook for dinner tonight. Be patient a little longer. Soon I'll take you both and we'll leave. If you need money, let me know and I'll wire it to you. It's a good thing you chose Pinsk. He named the very town they were living in now. So small, out of sight. I'll let you know when it's time to pack. I can't call you often, you know. But you'll still hear from me or through my men. And he'll be out of our lives. So many feelings of pleading, rage and disgust were put into these few words that even Michael was affected. There was silence for two seconds. Song, do you really want to be alone? Michael asked softly. What do you mean alone? I don't think you'll go back to your mom. You've long since weaned yourselves off each other. Your father might need your presence, your help. Cirrhosis is such a thing. Maybe taking care of dad will make you feel better about losing your baby. Nancy felt her eyes popping out of her orbits. It happens in moments of extreme terror. I want to tell you a story that concerns you and me directly. You don't know, of course that once upon a time during an operation, a sickly and beautiful little girl named Evelyn was born, and a sickly boy with multiple disabilities called cerebral palsy. 
You were sound asleep under anesthesia and didn't know anything. Why would you be so upset? So I decided to give you a gift. This little girl you got cost me a lot of money, but she's worth it, isn't she? And now you and I may be doing very well, or you may be doing very badly. Where is it now? I'm telling you, it's either really, really good or really bad. The hour will come when everything will be settled, everything will be prepared, and the three of us will go abroad, under different names, of course. And there, if you want to, you can see this child. But what if I don't? Evelyn's real parents are looking for her blessing. I don't expect you to believe me. Take a DNA test yourself at a lab of your choice. Get the results, and then I'll call you, and we'll have a good talk. She woke up on the floor, and it took her a long time to realize if she was still alive and functioning, or if she had had a stroke, for example. And now she couldn't move her arm. Somehow she crawled to the bed and frightened the female. Returned from school by the fact that she could hardly speak and did not think well. The girl cooked her own dinner, brought her mother tea and sandwiches. She knew about those who are sick. It is necessary to take care. But Nancy could not eat, and only made a sign for her daughter to leave her alone. It wasn't until nightfall that consciousness finally cleared. Now Nancy could not forgive herself that the conversation had ended this way, though it was not up to her. No matter how monstrous what Michael had said, Nancy had believed him. And now she was tormented by several questions at once how to make her stay with her forever. Because she would never accept that the girl was not her own daughter. How to find out what was wrong with her own son. Where is he? How to take him back to her. And finally, how to free herself from Michael. It was possible to go crazy from it, because to achieve all the goals at the same time, apparently, it is impossible. Or tie your life to a criminal you hate or losing both kids. Another option to try to get out of harm's way at least. Nancy had never liked detectives, never read them. She didn't like feeling like a fool. For a hundred or two pages, the author led the reader to a clue, occasionally giving clues, lighting up beacons. In the end, when it came to the last pages, the reader only had to slap his or her forehead. God, how could I not have guessed who the culprit was? It was so easy. But Nancy, now it seemed that she was in some surreal labyrinth, in some nightmare. And she didn't know how to get out, because she had no experience. She went to a nearby town, bought a cell phone, a SIM card that wasn't registered to her, and called Cindy the investigator. Never would she tell her the whole truth because it would be taken away from her immediately and get to the bottom of who her real parents were. Nancy only said that Michael occasionally calls her with threats, so she wants to change her documents through the registry office, take a different last name, and cut off loose ends, go somewhere where she and her daughter won't be found. She understands everything, but she is not going to become a live wire to catch Michael. She's a weak woman, and she's scared. Surprisingly, they backed her up, gave her the go-ahead, even put her in touch with some people. Just ask her to take her time and do it carefully. Maybe there'd be another call that would clear things up. There was a call, just not the one Nancy had expected or Cindy had hoped for. Later, Nancy decided it was her own fault. How could you? She asked. You mean the boy? He grinned, somewhat grudgingly. He's alive, not starving. He could have gone to the showdown. I've had that thought. Basically inferior specimens. That's when she screamed monster and started banging the phone against the wall because the only alternative was to bang her head into the wall. The very next day she rented a car, a house and left with Evelyn, taking the bare minimum of belongings with her and cut all ties. And there were new papers and new cities and nightly prayers that the man who had created all this would disappear, dissolve, melt away like smoke without a trace, and that even if she never sees her son, God will take care of him wherever he is. But never, never again would Nancy be able to relax and everything else that came into her life, and that desire to learn to shoot. And these apartments she'd so carefully picked out with alarms, preferably backdoor, 
was the kind of craziness that would stay with her until the end. To give birth, Christina went to her parents. They were overjoyed. The rest of her acquaintances were perplexed to trade a huge city, where the apartment, career for a small town, in which to find a job, where the salary of 20 it is normal, and 30,000 means fabulous luck, that the girl came here, she's going to have a baby without a husband. It's a bad time, no one can blame her, and it's all over the place nowadays. But the parents didn't recognize the daughter and Christina, who used to come home only at night. It was like that since 15 years old, then at friends' houses, then at some parties, festivals. You'd never know, as long as she called to say she was alive. Christina hasn't left the house right now. And not to say that she was not feeling well, but all day long either lay with headphones, with the phone, or sat, and as a model mother, undermined diapers. In vain, her mother tried to send her at least to the store, at least to the park for a walk. And every day the parents noted in the daughter more and more oddities, more than once or twice a day, she came to check if the front door was locked. She couldn't stand it when someone came without prior arrangement. She made her mother ask who to look through the peephole. And if she was home alone, she never opened the door for anyone. What happened? One time, my mother couldn't take it. Did you get ripped off or something? Christina only shook her head negatively. But her mother's imagination knew no bounds, and she whispered in the kitchen with her father. There must have been a theft after all and probably even threatened, maybe with a knife. Oh, what if she'd been abused, and a baby? Here already Christina could not stand it, came out and asked tired, Mom, what are you talking about? Write novels, we're novels to real life. Olechka, don't be afraid, we'll bring up even from Freddy Krueger. Oh my God, I think I'm drunk, even though I'm not allowed, Daddy. Would you tell her? I've told you 100 times. A married man, that's all. Doesn't run around with gloves, fingers, blades, and a striped sweater. Christina took a whiskey. That's right. She got a really bad headache and retired to her room. Her son came into the world quite safely. The labor had been easy. The only thing the midwife didn't like was the birthmark on the boy's cheek. When he's a little older, see a surgeon. You will operate, she said sympathetically to the young mother. The fact that Christina was even happy about this cosmetic effect was beyond her imagination. And Christina thought most of all in this market are good-looking girls. A boy with such a flaw wouldn't be of interest to him. Probably not. She convinced herself of this, and yet she was afraid to let the child out of her hands. Other mothers, especially experienced ones, willingly agreed to let their infants spend the night in the pediatric ward and bring them in for feeding in the morning. Good night. This is a luxury. When else will there be an opportunity to sleep for hours on end, to recuperate? And Christina wanted her son to sleep not in a crib, but with her, between herself and the wall to crush the little one. Scolded the midwives for sleeping and imagining. Christina put her son in the crib, but at night, when the lights were turned off in the room, she still did her own thing. Though it was foolish to think anyone would break in, no one disturbed her. She was discharged from the maternity hospital, and for a while she led the life of a recluse. All was quiet, no call, no letter, much less a visit. Although if desired Michael could easily find out where she lived and who she gave birth to. Gradually she and began to walk with a stroller. And when Benjamin began to walk, she already let him play in the sandbox with other children. But Christina never agreed to do the operation, even though her parents persuaded her to do it later, she said. Benjamin went to kindergarten. They were preparing for the matinee, and Christina was going to dress up her son in a night costume. That's when the phone rang. Do you need anything for your son? Michael asked, as if they'd broken up yesterday. And since he didn't hear the answer, I continued, that's why I'm asking, because I'll be leaving soon for good, and it's unlikely that you'll be able to contact me afterwards. Do the operation, Benjamin. We are beautiful. 
and our guy should be just as good. I'm sorry about the way things turned out between us. I'll see if I can help you guys later. But right now, I have to get Nancy out, even though she doesn't know it yet. Christina had a client Christina used to do her apartment. It took three wagons and two carts of patience. Today, everything was agreed upon, down to the color of the lid on the washing machine in the bathroom. But in the evening, the client had dinner with a friend that tossed her fresh ideas, and in the morning the carefully crafted project fell apart like a house of cards. One idea pulled the next, and there was no end to it. In the end, Christina S. cancelled because she saw it wasn't working, and she cared about her name. God forbid the client will start bragging about who designed her apartment. Christina brought the client to her home. Oh, said the woman and sank down on the couch to take a slow look. I like it. Please do me the same. The issue was resolved, and now this same client helped Christina get the addresses of Nancy's parents. She had the right connections, and the matter took half an hour. Addresses, phone numbers. There was no way a father and mother wouldn't know where their daughter and granddaughter were. Christina called the mother first. The woman appeared to have a very young, gentle, and cold voice. Although Christina had manufactured and rehearsed in advance what she would say, to be brief and to the point, you do not find that the friend of the ex-husband is not the best recommendation. Nancy's mother asked with a slight sneer, we both know what kind of husband he is, and I know what you mean by friend. I won't tell you Nancy's address, and don't you dare blackmail me with the danger she's in. Don't call again. There was one last hope for her father. Christina tried calling him several times, but no one picked up. Finally, when she had given up hope, she answered, judging by her voice, some old woman, and he sold the apartment, the old woman said, after she found out who the neighbors were. The last thread had broken, and he hadn't left a new address or even a phone number. Christina begged because she had no hope anymore. Did you buy this apartment? No, I was his neighbor. The grandmother explained, and he's in a hospice. But you know, the one on Nikitinsky. The parents agreed to look after Benjamin. When Christina saw Nancy's father, she immediately realized that he didn't have much time left, maybe only days. His face was yellow, like a mask of skinny lice. The man was lying in the ward, and at the appearance of the guest, did not even make an attempt to rise. He no longer had the strength to do so. Christina moved a chair closer, sat down, and spoke openly. She had no other choice but to reveal her cards fully. She told both about her long association with Michael and about the fact that, while she knew of Nancy's existence, she hadn't considered it, and about the fact that she hadn't known she could hate like that. And if Nancy was not worn now, there was a glass of water by his table, and in it was a pipe. Christina understood what that meant. The man can't lift his own head, and he can't take the glass. Someone has to put that tube in his lips. The man still had the strength to touch her hand with cold fingers. I believe you. Especially since I can't protect anyone else. That man has deprived me of even having my daughter by my side when I... He sighed. I sold the apartment to buy her a house. It was picked up at my request by a small town in the cabin a small fortress. Bars on the windows, iron doors. Even a cellar under the house that you can climb into and lock yourself inside, a kind of safe for people who need protection. And I'm the only one who knows the address. I'll tell you. Remember it. It was a nice little town that must have looked marvelous in the summer. But never before or anywhere had Nancy been treated with such longing, and the house her father had chosen for her suited them perfectly. It stood on an eminence from which everything was perfectly visible. It was like a little fortress. But Nancy was unpacking and crying, trying to hide her tears from her daughter. She had to be with her father now, though he understood and had forbidden her to come. Said he would call her when he felt like it. What kind of forces were helping this ghoul who had broken her life time after time? And not just her. How does he keep finding her over and over again? Was he aided by some extensive network of helpers, or was he working with a psychic? Nancy was ready to believe anything, but had to pull herself together 
and start over once again. Amazingly, every time Nancy felt like the strength was gone, completely gone. Even on the driveway, they would come from somewhere and she would do what she needed to do again. She walked around the house from attic to floor, checking every door, every frame, making sure the bars on the windows were secure and the locks were in good working order. When she started checking for the third time, she was convinced she was getting paranoid. She was very thirsty. Nancy rarely allowed herself that, but right now she'd give anything for a couple cans of stout beer. But what there was she generously squirted into a cup of valerian, squeezed water. It turned out to be a brandy version. Nancy drank it in one gulp. So what's school like here? Alex asked. Her mother could no longer completely hide the danger from her, as she had done before. But the girl's psyche was still surprisingly plastic. She was not in danger of depression. She didn't like her new room very much. It wasn't that it was small, but the window faced north. And on top of that, it faced a blank fence. Alex hung posters of her favorite artists on the wall. With familiar faces staring back at her, she felt at home everywhere. I don't know, Nancy shrugged for now. Let's think about homeschooling. Cool. You'll be able to go out at least some of the time. Nancy felt in this question the longing of a creature, locked in a cage and longing for a little freedom of a mother, who limits her sick children in something. One realizes otherwise it is impossible. No one can make their child live by other rules. But by 40, she was healthy. She should be out riding her bike with her friends, going to ballroom dances and birthday parties with her girlfriends. And Nancy keeps her in a cage. Give me a week. She asked her mother to look around. I'll see what's going on and decide. Alex took a deep, deep breath. And Nancy, looking at her daughter's face, wondered how she hadn't noticed it before. No, she knew Alex was nothing like her. Not one bit. Not a single trait in common. But Michael seemed to have something in common. Girls often look more like their fathers than their mothers. And vice versa. So her son looks like her. But why was it all just on her shoulders? Nancy honestly tried to recall if she had fallen in love with anyone in her youth other than Michael. But at least there were some portraits on the walls like a female. Had she married too young? Yeah, maybe when she was watching action movies. Michael loved the genre, sometimes identified with the heroine, whom the hero saved from every conceivable and unthinkable danger, with whom there is no need to be afraid and day and night the brain will not be drilled with thoughts. Have you foreseen everything? No need to think about anything. It's like being behind a stone wall. One of her friends had a husband who looked nothing like a movie hero. An old man, a little heavy and completely gray, a former military pilot. Olai had a severe form of diabetes. Her daughter was born with Down syndrome. But how Ethan loved his girls. How he worried about forgetting to take their medication. He planted a garden of Eden for them outside his house. His friends gave them to his daughter, because riding is, you know. Even when she, Nancy, who seemed to have nothing to do with Ethan, was near him, she felt safe, as if nothing bad could happen to her. A week had passed in the new place, and the promises made to Hanka had to be fulfilled. In the morning, Nancy said I will go to the bakery. But the habit she had lately acquired of carrying a gun with her always and everywhere she could not give up. If any policeman tried to search her, it would end badly. Nancy fell only on the fact that it would never occur to anyone in a small town. Auntie goes to get bread, crosses the road at a green light. What do you gentlemen in uniform want with her? The day was surprisingly nice. They loved flowers in this town. Here and there in the front garden they were memorialized with velvets, honey wendy. The majors were rising proudly. Nancy remembered that as a child she could not remember the names of these flowers. They were called Lieutenant Colonel. You promoted them too. Father laughed. She lingered in the bread store, taking some pleasure in shopping for the first time in a long time. The bread smelled so good here under arrest. Such beautiful cakes lay in the display case. Nancy was choosing what to take for breakfast, what would please the loaf of kalachi, poppy seed pies, yogurt with peaches, a simple loaf for sandwiches, 
delicately pink sausage. She was approaching the house when someone sitting on the low metal fence stood up and stepped toward her. Hi, a tall man in a black jacket, a cap covering not only his forehead but his eyebrows as well. It took Nancy two seconds to recognize Michael had already overwhelmed her. Maybe if Nancy had been a professional fighter in the military, training to the point of complete automaticity of movement, the gun would already be in her hands. But the shooting range was one thing and another. She'd never pointed a barrel at a live target, not even a rat. Her only hope was that he didn't know she had a gun at all. Let's talk, he said peacefully and even with a smile. Like he was just a regular Sunday butterfly who had come to make arrangements to visit the baby at a certain time. There were so many words Nancy wanted to say, and they were tearing from her throat. But she restrained herself to let Michael speak first. What does he want? We'll go away, he said. Finally, it all came together. All the docks are in hand. It's a great opportunity waiting for us. We're going to Europe, small town too, but not as shit as here. We'll have our own house waiting for us. I'll continue doing what I love, selling fashion secrets. You'll grow tulips. We'll put posture in a good school, just like the one you went to when you were a kid. He kept his trump card up his sleeve. And if you want, you can see your son once in a while. I don't think he should be taken away from where he lives now. Handicapped people don't belong amongst ordinary people. But my dear, how long will it take you to pack? We're not going anywhere with you, she said. He raised his eyebrows. But you realize that in this case you never will, and I'll try to find him myself. But even if you don't, you've heard read your ears ten times. I'm not going anywhere with you, and you're not taking me to the bank. Michael stared at her for a long time. Maybe a minute, maybe even longer. Well, he said, this was practically your last chance. There's a spark of hope left, so to speak. He held one hand down, and now something clicked distinctly in it. Nancy shuddered, but remained silent. Then Michael spoke. You want to know that it's now a fire starting in your house, a remote control, the kitchen catching fire. And it's going to go very fast from there. Your plan, my house, my fortress is now playing against you. Bars on the windows, iron door. You won't open it, by the way, while you were buying caps. That's clever. It didn't take a man to pull a key out of your pocket, so the sled won't get out of there. She might last longer if she guessed to hide in the bathroom. But smoke and fire, Michael shrugged. They'll get her anyway. And I don't see a man with a car nearby to snag a rope, rip the bars off the window, and don't look at me like I'm an animal. That's not my daughter. And that girl has nothing to do with me. Of course, I can still open the door. Do you have the key? Asked Nancy. The gun was already in her hand. One thing she hadn't expected was that he would knock it out with an elusive, sudden movement. What didn't he expect? It was that the weapon would fly at the girl's feet, which approached them at that instant. Christina had never known how to shoot. She didn't know anything about how to load a gun, didn't know what a safety was. Only in movies had she seen the trigger pull, her hands shaking. She was just so damn lucky. The day was so overcast that at 12 o'clock it felt like dusk. Nancy's route was from cemetery to cemetery. She hailed a cab and asked to be taken to her father's house. The plot was new, and just beyond her father's grave, there was still a forest growing, pine trees standing. And the ground here was bloody bad, just rocks. Nancy, like many people, came to the cemetery and distracted herself with thoughts. We should order some proper soil, plant some flowers. No, Dad really liked the smell of pine needles. Sooner or later the big spruce trees cut down the forest, and on the grave she'll plant dwarf ones, and the monument she had already looked closely at a simple granite one, with a white marble rose that lay on top. She wanted very much to hug the cross, and sob like a little girl, in her voice. Nancy knew what she would do, so a little later she would come home, and while Alex is at school, she will drink a glass of vodka and cry and even howl and bang her head on the table. But right now, hold out a little longer. 
The cab driver wasn't leaving. She asked him to stick around. Nancy gave him the address of another cemetery in the suburbs. You have a memorial today, the driver clarified. He was in a good mood and wanted to talk. The passenger seemed calm, but he couldn't talk to her. When had he turned on the music? Nancy walked slowly toward Michael's grave. It's 40 days today. One could only hope that his soul would never return from hell. A turn in the alley, then another. There was someone at the grave. A woman in a coat so deep red you couldn't take your eyes off her red hat with a little boy in her arms. Had she really come to? As Nancy approached, the woman turned around and Nancy recognized Christina. Christina lowered Benjamin from her arms. I've been thinking, she said, as if continuing the conversation. Why is there a cross here? There should be an aspen stake. I've been thinking about that too. It was autumn. No frost. No tears. Nancy wiped her face with her gloved hand. But he won't get up. Can we have a dance? Asked Christina in a whisper. I wore boots with sharp heels on purpose. You can do it on the loose clay. On the red hill, she tried to dance something like an awkward read along with the sharp heels. Nancy put her arms around her and pressed her against her. They stood in silence for a long time, and then sat down on a bench that stood by another grave, but not far from where Michael lay. What about you? Nancy asked. I'm going back to my house for good. And you, Christina, have you been crying? I'm looking, said Nancy. I don't know if I'll find it or not, but I'll keep looking as long as I live. And I don't have any leads yet. All I know is that in Europe they're going to walk to every home for the disabled, every orphanage. Maybe he's living with a family somewhere. You don't even know a name. Nancy shook her head only that he would probably look like me, even though he's very sick. And what about Evelyn? I mean, you realize now what it's like for her real parents. I'd like to get her to 18 so she's not taken away from me, so she can decide where she wants to go, who she wants to be with. But I realize that for the people who lost her every day is an eternity without her. I don't know. It's really hard to think about. Maybe we worked it out somehow. I don't know what kind of people are out there. I need to see them. What's next? God knows. We live as a family. Or have her stay at my place or theirs by the time she's 40. How he tied it all into one devilish knot. Nancy waved helplessly. Benjamin became bored. He wandered between the graves, examining them. On one sat a white stone dove. On another, a plump angel spread its wings. On a third, an aunt with a long blanket on her head covered her face with her hands. She seemed to be crying, and here there was a candle lit. Careful, it won't fall on any reward. His mother shouted to him. What's decided about the operation? Asked Nancy Christina. It's a piece of cake for any plastic surgeon, she replied. Maybe I'll wait until after Benjamin goes to school. I understand about the painkillers and all that, but I have such a low pain threshold right now that I can't even squash a cockroach. Your house is a work of art. Are there really cockroaches in there? They laughed. It was a kind of laughter. A timid little audible one. And yet, Benjamin knew which grave they had come to. It was dull to the point of disgust, dull, red earth, and nothing else. Near one of the monuments there were roses in a stone vase. Benjamin pulled one flower, a dark red poe, that seemed particularly beautiful to him. Benjamin decided to put the rose on the grave of the man for whom his mother and that aunt were crying. No, the women shouted with glee. Surprised Benjamin almost dropped the rose. The rain had stopped freezing. It was a little brighter around. Even a bird made a sound. Benjamin went over and taking advantage of the fact that his friends were talking about something. He shot the flower, shot it, strangled it, and started dropping petals in their laps. 